The next presentation will be by somebody who probably many of you already know. It is Matthias Wilson. He uh, is a professional in the field of intelligence for a couple of decades, worked in government and private sector, um, has actually done signals intelligence with the German Foreign Intelligence Agency, BND, I guess that is, Matthias. And, um, okay, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> track that comment. Um, but he has worked in government doing legit Intel stuff uh, and as well in the private sector. He has done OSINT training. Um, currently, he is also on the OSINT Curious Advisory Board and he's very active in the community. If you're on Twitter you, and are into OSINT, you've probably come across him in one point or another. So without further ado, here is Matthias. Thank you very much, John, for that introduction. And welcome to my short presentation on what you can do with mobile applications in the world of OSINT. So no need to further introduce myself. I am just an OSINT enthusiast, uh, as many of you are. I spend a lot of my time at work and in my free time doing osint -y things. And since I love this uh, topic, OSINT intelligence. I'm really keen on giving something back to the community and sharing some of the knowledge that I have picked up from so many OSINT mentors in this talk today. The topic will be using mobile phone apps for OSINT. So we're basically gonna be leaving your browser and looking into the cool things that you can do with mobile applications. Now, just a, a short agenda of what I'll be talking about the next 40-ish minutes. I'm going to give you an overview of the actual value of phone numbers and in investigations. So what can you do if you have a phone number as a starting point in your investigation? And then you will quickly see that there are a limited amount of things you can do when using a browser on your computer. And we can basically broaden that scope by using mobile phones. And there are different techniques and different methods um, to actually gain additional information, additional data based on something so simple as a, as a phone number. Uh, we'll also look at what you can do with the information that you win using these methods. So it's basically going to be a walkthrough through kind of a complete investigation starting with basic, basic OSINT techniques and then going into the things you can do with your phones and also showing you the possibilities to win information, get data with those techniques and use them in other tools that some of you are probably already aware of. And last but not least, I'm just gonna wrap it up and, and give you some of the key takeaways um, that I think are important when looking at using mobile phone apps for investigations. Now let's start off with chapter one, basically, um, the value of a phone number in investigations. Now, many of you, when you conduct investigations, if it's law enforcement or fraud intelligence, um, brand protection, you might come across a phone number at a certain point in time. This could be a phone number from someone on a marketplace that is selling goods that you're tracking down. This could be in a law enforcement criminal case um, where you come across a phone number and want to find out who's behind that phone number. So there are many, many different use cases for this. Um, the one that I chose for today, and this is just in theory, I'm not going to show any personal data belonging to any individual, but the case that I will be showing today is basically a law enforcement case. Um, just to give you a little overview why the techniques that I'll be showing are relevant. So let's just imagine we're in a law enforcement unit and we arrive at some crime scene and there is a phone at that crime scene. Now we take a look at this phone and we see it's a very old phone. It still has buttons. I mean, my daughter wouldn't even know what this is. And we are able to look into the phone because it's not protected by pin password or anything like that. And we can see that there are incoming and outgoing calls. There are text messages. But unfortunately, we do not have any contacts, any names saved on this phone. So to figure out how this phone is basically related to our case, um, there are several things that we could do as law enforcement. And there are several steps ahead of that, which is basic OSINT. So 
We look at the phone again, um, send it to the digital forensics guys, for example. They also don't come back with anything. And now the question is, what are the next steps? What can we do with the, the, the information on this phone with the phone numbers? Can we link these to any individuals, for example? So a lot of you I know are in law enforcement and there are certain things that you can do and people like I can't do. Um, you can do a reverse phone number lookup, basically send a request to a provider to figure out who this phone number belongs to. Now, a lot of countries, it is still possible to, uh, to buy burner phones, so this might not be that helpful. Um, it could also be that the organization, the criminal organization that bought this burner phone, um, basically used a real-life sock puppet to obtain these SIM cards. So at the end of the day, doing a reverse phone number lookup might not lead to any results. Um, what law enforcement could also do is a cell mapping, just trying to figure out where this specific phone was geolocated in a certain period of time, where the other phone numbers that were calling this phone and receiving calls from this phone were geolocated in a specific time. And that might also be helpful for investigations. But we're gonna leave the law enforcement world and take a step back and go to the very fundamental and basic things that most of us can do. And then I will show you certain tips and tricks when you have such a phone number and how to obtain additional information on that phone number. So first and foremost, we're talking about open source intelligence. That's the reason we've all gathered here, uh, which most of you know is mostly free. I mean, every once in a while you will stumble upon a paid service, which might provide you very good information on that data point on that phone number. But a lot of things I'm showing today are free. Um, one of the benefits of these investigations is they are quick and easy to do. Um, you mostly get direct results um, rather than waiting for a request uh, to come back from a provider or an internet provider, um, you will have your results right away. And for those of you who are in law enforcement or possibly in organizations where you are allowed to request information from providers, um, you might be saving a lot of paperwork. So you could be able to not solve the case, but find information that will help you solve the case by doing the very basic and simple OSINT steps beforehand. Now, let's take a look at one example. We have a phone number here on the left and uh, me coming from SIGINT, I, I can tell you the country code and I can tell you the mobile network code and which provider it is and then you have the subscriber number. So the first and fundamental step is to kind of understand how phone numbers are structured because that will be relevant later on in your investigations when you are choosing the applications which you will feed your phone number into. So in this case, we have plus 27, that is the country code for South Africa. We have a 600, that is a South African mobile carrier. And then we have the subscriber number. So just by looking at this phone number, I know maybe my investigations will lead me to South Africa. So I'm gonna to have to look for data sources for popular apps in South Africa. Now, the first thing that we can do, and that is very, very simple, is just Google it. And not just Google it, Bing it, DuckDuckGo it, Yandex it. Just use search engines and use basically all the Google dorking um, that you can because there might be different ways to write this phone number. So this way, as I have written it, without the spaces, different numbering blocks, just try things out and then you might get results if you're lucky. Here you can see this phone number actually belongs to the South African COVID hotline. So I actually, in preparation for this uh, um, presentation, just Googled phone number 123456. It was the first thing that popped up. And as you can see, it has a fairly large footprint on the internet. Um, what you can also do here is look at the images that are displayed in Google, Bing, or Yandex, because some of them are OCR, so they contain optical character recognition, which extracts text from images and makes that searchable as well. So you might be able to get results here. And in this example, of course, they're all leading to official websites. If we're talking about a private phone number, um, we might end up finding this phone number listed in some kind of classified, some kind of ads. And that also might give you an overview of who you are dealing with. Now, going away from search engines, the next step would be doing the same thing in social media. Each and every social media platform, of course, has search possibilities. So just take that phone number 
in various writings, in various different ways to write it down and put it into Facebook or VK or Twitter and see what pops up. And with this example, we find results on Facebook, of course, both text-based results, but also results um, coming from images where Facebook did an OCR on the image, extracted this phone number as text and made it searchable. And we also find it on Twitter, and I'm pretty sure we could find it on lots of different other social media sites. So very, very basic. Now, this is an example where I took an official phone number, of course. What would happen if we have a private phone number? Well, then, in many cases, we would come up with nothing, neither on Facebook or any other social media or on Google or any other search engines. So the question here is, what do we do from there? Does our OSINT work stop the moment that we do not find anything with these tools? Well, of course not. We can take this phone number and put it into paid databases and see what they come back with, or we can do something which I'm about to show to you. So the main topic for today would be leveraging information uh, investigations with mobile applications. Uh, to put it in very, very simple words, um, we're just emulating the, the user of a phone and doing the same thing that you and everyone else does when they receive a phone number and type it into their phone. So it's very, very simple. And there are a couple of ways to do this. But again, we have this phone number and we take this phone number, put it in our phone, save it in the contacts, and then we give basically the apps on the phone access to the contacts and thus to this phone number. Now, what you can see here is I use an example of a real phone. So when I do my investigations, I have lots of different phones that I actually use um, where I would save contacts, uh, save phone numbers and see what happens. Uh, the reason for this being, if I do this on a phone, there are certain applications that work better on a real phone than in a virtual machine or an emulator. Um, also, I tend to use an iPhone, one of the two old iPhones that I have, uh, because there are certain things that might work better on an iPhone as well. Just one example, uh, if you have an Apple ID, um, you are able to log on to various different services with that Apple ID without having to provide your phone number or an extra email address. So it's just kind of another layer of security. For example, you can log on to TikTok using the Apple ID and then TikTok will not get your phone number or your email address and you can still use TikTok um, the way that I will show it later on. Um, but there are other reasons to use virtual machines or emulators. And since this talk only has 40 minutes, 45 minutes, um, I'm not going to go into details on how to set these up and what you can do in general. Um, this could be a two or three day course with all the possibilities in mobile applications, but I'm just going to mention that there are things like BlueStacks and GenieMotion, which will emulate an Android device for you, and you can also actually download a VM. So what happens if we do this? We put the phone number into the contacts and we allow the apps access to these contacts. The apps will come back and say, hey, I know you. I know something about this phone number. And what that is, we'll see a bit later on. Now, before we get started, um, this is something that is very important to me. Always keep OPSEC in mind. That is, if you are working with a target's phone number, um, of course, you should not save that in your personal phone's contacts. That doesn't make any sense. Why? because you are allowing apps to have um, access to your contacts. You're allowing tech companies like Facebook and Google and many other more access to your contacts. And they will conduct profiling on you. They will say, well, you know, these 10 phone numbers, they've been there for a while and this one is new and let's kind of link them together. So in the worst case, um, this can actually lead to uh, friendship suggestions on Facebook. If you have that phone number linked to Facebook, this could actually make a target aware of your investigations. So always, always, always use a burner phone and a burner SIM card or a burner VM when conducting these investigations. Another thing is since you are sending data out to big corporations, 
on some of the data, especially if you're working in the intelligence community, in law enforcement, may be so sensitive that I would not recommend sending everything to these big corporations. Even if you were to mask the phone number, so you upload your target's contact and then you upload 200 other phone numbers um, and try to mask that, you are still sending this data out. So me coming from a SIGINT background, um, there were cases in the past where I would receive phone numbers um, from highly classified sources. And of course, I would not use these phone numbers in an OSINT context. The next thing you should try not to do is not to mix cases. Uh, again, this is because there are big corporations that are doing a certain amount of profiling. And if you mix the, the drug ring case with the homicide case, this could also lead to the individuals that you are investigating um, kind of being brought together on social media. We don't only need a phone number to register a lot of these apps. Um, sometimes we really have to create sock puppets. So have accounts ready, for example, on Instagram. And again, here, just follow the basic guidelines on the use of sock puppets. And I know OSINT Curious has great blog articles on and 10 minute tips on this topic. And last but not least, when we're talking about OPSEC, please do not use real names in the contacts. And why this is relevant, I'll show you a bit later on. So if you save a phone number in your contacts, um, just save it under some pseudonym, some random name um, where you can still remember who it belongs to, but don't go by the real name. Now, looking into the virtual phones, just really briefly, um, there are some reasons you should use VMs or emulators rather than a real phone. Um, one of these reasons could actually be saving evidence. So if you set up an Android VM, for example, on the right, you see my basic Android VM, which is an Android 9. I downloaded it from OS boxes. I installed it with VMware. And then I have a specific set of basic apps installed. And after each and every case, I just basically delete this VM. And then I, for the next case, uh, pull out the kind of uh, clean version of that um, with the basic apps installed. And then the only thing I have to do is actually register them. So again, I will need a text message verification for this in most cases. Um, I tend to use a real SIM card for that. I know there are services online where you can get text messages for free. A lot of times these won't work because they have been used so often to register things. And there are also paid services online, but I'm sure that's something that you can Google. Again, if you're working with uh, things like Instagram, for example, just have a sock puppet ready or create that on that VM. And like I said before, not all apps will run smoothly. Um, Snapchat is kind of a pain in the butt because it requires a front facing camera. Um, there are workarounds uh, to get it running on emulators and VMs, um, but I'm just too lazy to do that. So I would, if I wanna work with Snapchat, always go back to a real physical phone. So for example, this old phone. Um, most of us get new phones every two years. I, I don't sell the old ones. I, I don't give them away. I don't throw them away. I just keep collecting my old burner phones. But also keep in mind, um, depending on how sensitive the case is, if this was a phone that used to belong to you, um, even if you completely erase it and get it back to factory settings without going into too many details, there might be some data on there that can still link you to the previous profiles. And what you can do if you have this on your computer, a virtual machine or an emulator, is it's quite easy to transfer evidence to your workstation. So you can take screenshots, or in a lot of cases, you can really get the complete audit trail by kind of screen capturing, videotaping what you are doing while you are doing it. I know that a lot of law enforcement agencies require that as well. Now, if we're working on a real phone, um, there are also possibilities to save evidence here. Um, one of them, which I do quite often, is screen mirroring. So basically, I install software on my computer. I install software or an app on the phone. In this case, Let's View. And then I mirror this phone onto my screen and could also screen capture it, record it. So as you can see here, I'm going into Instagram. I'm clicking on something. I'm going through Instagram. This was actually on my phone, but I recorded it on my PC. So this might also be another way to actually transfer evidence works on Android, works on iPhone. I can give a couple of links to tools like this later on in the hallway. Um, 
One thing you can do, of course, is take screenshots from your phones. And I know a lot of people, then they get really creative and they basically set up an email account on their phone, send that screenshot from their email account on their phone to their email account on their computer. Uh, just keep it simple. Just hook up a cable if possible and just download those screenshots or those screen captures. Um, also one possibility, one thing you can do. Several apps uh, which have a mobile version, um, WhatsApp, for example, Telegram also have a desktop version. Um, so that also might be something that you synchronize WhatsApp and Telegram with your browser and you're able to do some of the investigations and pull some of the data from the browser. So that was it about saving evidence from the phone. And now let's get into the juicy part. What do we need? So the basic methodology is putting a phone number in your contacts and allowing apps to access these contacts and then come back with whatever information this app provides, which again leads to the fundamental question, well, what do we need? And you can see there are tons of apps, millions of apps, uh, and it's not as easy to answer this question, which apps should you use, which apps do you need? A very general answer could be basically anything that accesses your contacts and links these to profiles or gives you any information back. And then there are several other apps that I'll show later on that also might be useful. Now, the question which apps you actually need really, really depends on who you are looking into, which target set you are looking into. And next up is a slide that I basically use in all of my trainings and a lot of my presentations, um, just to make it clear that when we're talking about social media research or research in communications channels, um, we really have to understand uh, the social and cultural backgrounds of our targets to a certain degree. So let, let's take uh, an old white man, me for example, a German speaking old white man, um, you might find me on Facebook. Uh, my daughter says Facebook is for old people. I'm not on it, but I do know that there is a difference between Generation Z, millennials, and boomers, and whatever. Um, you might find people on career networks, such as LinkedIn, or the top left icon is Xing, which is kind of a German LinkedIn, or you might find people on Twitter. Now, if I were to take a look at the communication habits of my daughter, my teenage daughter, it would look completely different. Like I said, Facebook is for old people. That's what she says. Um, she would be on TikTok, for example. Uh, she could be on Snapchat. She could be on Instagram. Or she could be on something which is quite popular in Germany and also, I think, in the UK called Telonin, which is this really weird app where people can anonymously send each other insults. At least that's what I see from it. But it will also provide information on younger people. Now, I'm not talking about investigating children here, but a lot of these uh, Generation Z youths, um, 18, 19, 20-year-olds might be relevant in our investigations and might still have a past on some of these apps that they've used as children. And a lot of the stuff that we're seeing nowadays is that people, at least in Germany, are kind of wandering off from social media, uh, at least the open, the broadcast social media, and going into closed networks um, where they're basically using WhatsApp, for example, as social media. So that would be something that you also have to look into. Then if we look into the cultural background, if someone comes from a foreign area, you might not find them on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You might find them on something that is more typical to that region. So just on the right, a couple of examples, a German social media site, two Russian social media sites, a Polish social media site, a Chinese social media site, lots and lots of differences. And depending on which target you are looking into, that will define which apps you should use in your investigations. I mean, it doesn't do any harm taking a phone number and putting it in all apps basically and trying to pull data. But if you kind of know where you're going for, what you're going for, it'll at least save some time. And Last but not least, um, what we're seeing nowadays is a lot of the social media, like I said, is going into more of a closed network. So Telegram, for example, um, I'm not going to go into details on Telegram. I'll get to that a bit later, but there are some cool things that you can do with apps like this as well. So let's start out with the very basic example, 
WhatsApp, a, a messaging service. Um, a lot of people use that, have used it in the past. A lot of people are not using it anymore because of the new terms and conditions that WhatsApp is bringing out. I'll tell you something about that in a second, but let's just take a look at the phone number that we started out with, the plus 27 600 123456. I put this one into my phone. I allowed WhatsApp access to the contacts, and then I just went in WhatsApp to see what I can find. Now, this is an example where I have all kinds of data. Keep in mind, this is always subject to the privacy settings on someone's phone. So in most messaging apps, you would have a profile picture. This is something that you could use as a pivot point further on. In some of the apps, you will have a given username. So not necessarily the name you know your target by, but the name that the target uses to identify himself or herself on this messenger app. You could have a short bio. Here you can see this is the South African National COVID hotline or their COVID WhatsApp group. So you'll get an update every single day. When I made this presentation, January 31st, these were the, this was the information for that day. And this is updated every single day. So it might be worth looking into these apps more than once, just to get a general feeling of what is going on there. And if you're also lucky, some of the apps will provide you information on the last time this person or this app was online. So again, this is all subject to a target's privacy settings on the phone. Um, I would highly encourage most of you to not share all the information you can see here. Um, uh, if you have my phone number, I have a profile picture in there as well. It all depends on how much information you're willing to disclose, um, but just basically taking the full bundle as you have it here and putting it out there also for offset reasons, for personal offset reasons, is not a good idea. Now, going back to all this different data, which we have just collected in a minute, we put a phone number in the contacts, we allowed WhatsApp access to these contacts, went into WhatsApp, and now we have a lot of stuff that we can actually pivot on, that we can actually use in further research. For example, the images can be reverse image searched. Sometimes we'll have images of locations that we can do a geolocation challenge with that image and try to figure out where was that taken. That might give us indicators on where this target might be located. We have username and I'll get to that a bit later and I know Micah is very familiar with this and I'll put all the links, like I said, in the hallway. Um, the bio and the last online will kind of help you build a, I'll call it dossier, um, a target package uh, that might give you indications on who you're dealing with as well. So if someone has a foreign background and has something in Russian or Arabic in the status, uh, that might be something that is useful for you. So you know, hey, I'm dealing with someone that speaks Arabic. I'm dealing someone with someone that speaks Russian, and that might lead to additional investigation paths. Also, the last online might help you figure out a pattern of life when it comes to when is this person awake? When does this person use the phone? Um, there are many different use cases for this in law enforcement and uh, also for normal investigations. Law enforcement, for example, you know, trying to do some pre-planning before you have a sting operation or something like that, just based on this data. Not saying that just based on this data, you'll do that operation, but it could be the first indicator, hey, this person is always up until 4 a.m. in the morning. So if we want to go arrest him, maybe a bit later. Now, pre-COVID, I used to spend a lot of time uh, every day on a commute to work, sitting on the train. So I would use my phone for OSINT. Um, if I was conducting OSINT investigations, uh, for example, getting a profile picture or something like that, some of the things that I mentioned, for example, reverse image searching can be done on your phone as well. There are several apps that will send them out to Bing, Yandex, uh, Baidu, TinEye, Google Earth, Image Search, but you can also go to the apps or websites themselves and then just basically reverse image search things directly from your phone. And as always with reverse image searching, um, you have to get a bit creative. You have to crop the images sometimes. So you see here what I did on one of my burner phones. I took a picture, uploaded that to Google Lens, um, got some results, started cropping the image uh, to see how the results change. So a lot of the stuff you can do on your desktop, you can also do on your phone. 
So here, another example of using your phone to actually conduct OSINT investigations. And as always, just don't forget all the other search engines that are out there. It's not just Google, there's a lot more out there. And of course, if you have a picture of a person, again, for law enforcement or intelligence community, um, you might be able to run this through internal databases uh, to get a certain result. Now, I mentioned before that um, WhatsApp has changed their, their terms of service and everyone's freaking out because basically WhatsApp, or no, WhatsApp belongs to Facebook just like Instagram belongs to Facebook. And uh, a lot of the stuff in there is kind of a privacy nightmare if you really read through the small print. Um, and you can basically see that anything that you have on WhatsApp or Instagram, for example, will be shared with the, the, the mother corporation with Facebook. And a lot of people are really freaking out about this. Like, oh my God, this is really bad. We have to switch off Facebook. And that's the reason that apps like Signal or Telegram just went through the roof uh, in the past two or three months. Um, but I must say that this is something, this is not new. And I will give you a little example, um, a basic OPSEC mistake that I personally made. So just keep in mind that if you have data in one of these apps or platforms, it will always be shared among the other ones. And this has been done for years. Now, a couple of years back when I got my current private phone number, um, I used it to register an Instagram account. I never used that. I had the Instagram account on my computer. All I did was use the phone number to get the text message verification, and that was it. I had never used that account to actually do any research. Mid last year, that must have been two years after I registered the account, um, I decided to look into that Instagram profile again. And I open it on my computer and keep in mind, I have never had Instagram, the app or anything on my private phone. And then I got a lot of suggestions, people that I should connect with on Instagram. And each and every one of these people which are blurred out here are direct contacts from my phone, period. I actually reached out to some of them and asked, hey, which phone number did you use to register this account? And it was the phone number I had saved for them. So the only logical explanation for me was that what I had uploaded to WhatsApp was sent to Instagram. And when I logged on to Instagram the next time, I got all these nice suggestions. Now, privacy nightmare, OPSEC fa uh, failure on my side, but this is something that we can also use for OSINT. So if we're working in the Facebook environment with Instagram and WhatsApp, and we're uploading our contacts to WhatsApp, for example, have our burner phone linked to Facebook or Instagram, this also might lead to suggestions based on the phone numbers, which could be helpful in OSINT. Next up, let's look at another messaging app. And just to give you another idea of what you can get, what kind of information you can find here. So Snapchat is something that um, a lot of the younger people use quite frequently. I, I personally, I don't. I had to have it explained to me by my daughter. Um, on Snapchat, you have names, which in many cases are pseudonyms. You have an extra account handle, which can be equivalent to the name, but it could be something completely different. You have these bitmojis instead of the profile pictures, and these bitmojis may or may not look like the person behind it. And every once in a while, someone shares a public story. Now, again, the same principle, you upload your contacts to Snapchat, um, or you allow Snapchat access to your contacts, and it'll come back and say, hey, these are the people that you have in your phone book. But Snapchat is also really great for OSID because it says, and here are like 20 other people that might be linked to them. So I think, in my opinion, more aggressive than any other app or social media site I've seen by giving you additional suggestions on who to connect with, the people that are actually connected to your targets. Now, if you take a close look on this presentation, you have a guy in the middle, Bob the Builder, you know, with the builder's hat. And what he has here is a reference to his Instagram account name. So this is something that I see quite often, especially among the younger intelligence targets, that they will basically cross-reference their Snapchat with their Instagram, with their TikTok, um, sometimes ha even have that as the account name or the account handle. Um, so that will also give you an additional pivot point to go and find that other account. Um, also in Snapchat, you have the possibility not only to look for individuals like we did it here. So taking a phone number and trying to link an individual to that phone number, 
you also have the so-called snap map, which will give you videos in a specific area in a specific some small time frame, one or two days. Um, so you can zoom in like I did here. And again, this was all on my phone with the screen capture, go into London and just see what's happening. So if you're following a certain event, um, like what happened in, at the Capitol in January, this might be something that you could also use to collect evidence. Great blog articles by Osin Curious on how to save these videos, how to save this information. And uh, from what I've heard is that if you use the app, you can actually see the account that uploaded that. There is a browser version of this where you can basically scroll through the or zoom into the snap map in your browser. But often that will not give you the account behind that video that uploaded it. So the same thing we saw before, uploading contacts, getting information on the individual, getting a, a username, an account handle, and then something additional here, which is not so much based on people research, but based on looking into specific events and seeing what's going on in a certain area. Now, speaking of the usernames, uh, just very important for me to always show you what you can do with this information once you have obtained it. Our investigations don't stop here. We, we started out with one thing, getting the phone number, we put it into our phone, we got a username, then we pivot back to traditional OSINT, if I can call it that. Um, and we can go to a site, for example, What's My Name uh, from Micah Hoffman, really great site, just type in a username there and see what comes back. So in this case, I took my Twitter handle, MWOSINT, ran it through this uh, search engine, and then came back with uh, several accounts, some of them linked to me, some of them aren't linked to me. Um, so also just a reminder to kind of always verify the information you find. And if it's something that is a very generic account name or a very generic username, chances are high that you're basically going down the wrong, wrong rabbit hole if you start investigating that person. Now let's get to one thing that I find very, very interesting and what I also mentioned when talking about OPSEC, uh, caller ID apps. Caller ID apps such as TrueCaller, GetContact, CallApp, and many, many more, some of them even specific for a certain region, are basically online phone books. I'm not going to go into the reason that they exist, but for us in OSINT, we can use them just like we used the Messenger apps before. We give access to our contacts or we actually search in these apps for a specific phone number, and then we will receive a result. Now, what these do, these apps, is if you allow the contact to your contact, uh, the, the access to your contacts, they will not only pull the phone number, but they will also pull the name that you have saved. So that's the reason that you should never write your target's full name in your phone book on your phone. And on the right, you can see a very interesting example from a recent Bellingcat investigation where they used get contact, had a, um, a suspect in the Alexei Navalny poisoning, um, put that phone number in get contact, came back with three different entries and one of them actually said FSB Vladimir Alexandrovich Panyev. So someone actually saved this person in their phone as this is the Vladimir from FSB, which is the Russian uh, State Intelligence Service. So don't do this for OPSEC reasons. Do this for OSINT reasons when you research apps and then you might get additional information on the subject you're investigating. Now let's move on a bit forward to another unique thing that you can do when using mobile phones in OSINT. I'm not gonna talk about Telegram and the groups and how you can extract data there. Um, luckily, a good friend of mine, Sector035, published his week in OSINT this Monday with lots of cool content on researching Telegram. There's also a talk in there from Dutch OSINT guy, Nico Dekens. Um, there are several articles what you can do. So if you wanna know about Telegram and what you can do there very specifically, then I hope someone will post that link in the hallway. And if not, I'll do that later. But what I wanna show you now is an additional functionality in Telegram, which could be useful for OSINT investigations as well. This will enable us to do a certain amount of geolocating. So in Telegram, you can allow the app access to your own position. So of course, if you use a real phone, that won't be that helpful. This will be more something that you could do in an Android VM where you can get a GPS spoofer as an app and then spoof your GPS position to kind of go to places where you physically aren't. 
Now, what happens here is if you allow Telegram to geolocate you and you say, hey, show me friends nearby, it'll show you friends and groups nearby. So people, not friends, people nearby. You see here on the left, we have lots of people listed 100 meters away, 150 meters away, 250 meters away. If you look at those profiles, one of them you'll see on the right side, you can see there is a plethora of information on there as well, profile pictures. On Telegram, sometimes a lot more than on WhatsApp. The account name, references to other social media. For example, here on the bottom right, a reference to an Instagram account. And you can also look into specific Telegram groups in that vicinity. So again, if you are looking for a certain event and information on an event, this might be something to dive into. Set your GPS coordinate on your phone in the vicinity of that event and go and see if there are any groups that you can join with other methods then and try to get additional information. Now you can see here that there are very, very close people and very close groups to that position I was at that time. And you see here 100, 150 meters, 250 meters. And the question is, how accurate is this? Well, it is actually very accurate. Every time I go somewhere, I just test things and I would go for a walk and just see if I walk 100 meters, what happens here? And I would be 100 meters further. If I walk 30 meters, I would be 30 meters further to a target or um, um, further back. So that's something that we can actually also use to geolocate targets. Now, this is something I really like because this combines what I used to do in SIGINT, which is uh, basic direction finding with OSINT. So if I know that if I move my own location, the distance to a person or a target will change in the app, I can use this and basically put this on a map and triangulate the location of this target. So here, this is something I did, and this is complete bogus data, by the way. Don't try to find out what this is, but I went for a walk with my phone, and I was 1.7 kilometers away at a point. I was 1.6 kilometers away. I was 900 meters away. I was 2.5 kilometers away at a certain point. And then I would just take all this information and put it into a map. My position, draw a radius of the distance to the target, and wherever they overlap, the big red X, that is where you might find that person, unless they are GPS spoofing as well on their Android phone. Many, many different use cases for this, but something that we could also use in normal OSINT investigations. And that pretty much concludes the things that I wanted to show today. Just the magic behind it is very simple. You have a selector, a phone number, or an email. You put it in your phone, in your virtual phone, in the contacts, and then you allow a whole bunch of different apps access to these phone numbers, to these email addresses, and you'll come back with names, pseudonyms, pictures, locations, activities, interests, social media profiles, and so much more. And the interesting thing is if you're working on phones, it just doesn't stop there. There is so much more that you can actually do with your phone like I said, I used to commute for almost three hours a day, so I had a lot of time to do OSINT on my phone. Um, there might be regional social media apps that could be helpful. Um, information on license plates. If I'm in Italy, I have this nice little app where I can type in license plates, and it'll give me the vehicle identification number and the information on where that vehicle is insured. Sometimes you can do searches like this in classified apps and just a lot of other stuff. But again, the methodology is pretty simple. So to end today's talk, just a couple key takeaways. Um, using mobile apps on phones or virtual phones will often uh, offer data or access to data that is not available if you go through a browser-based search or it is not as, as easily accessible as using a browser. And as everything with OSINT, it's more about the combination of apps and techniques that will provide you with pivot points to move from one app to another or from one app back into your browser. So this is something that should be implemented into a whole process. For law enforcement or those working in the intelligence community, um, this is something that is less invasive than official inquiries with data hosts. So it might be the first step before you send out that inquiry sometime. So again, something that is cheap, but very effective. And last but not least, 
the whole methodology here to me is the most important thing. So the most important tool that you can have in OSINT also using these apps is what you have up here. Because the tools, the apps, they will change. They will go, you'll have new sources, you'll have different privacy settings which might disable some of the functions you had before. So just understand the basic methodology and then just try to figure out which apps, which sources your targets might use at that given time. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to what I had to say. And if you want to hear more about some of the stories that I have, go check me up on keyfindings.blog or at MWOSINT on Twitter. Thank you.